a very warm welcome to everybody uh, i would like to first introduce dr priyanka tripathi dr priyanka tripathi is an associate professor of english in the department of humanities and social sciences indian institute of technology patna she has published with journal of international women study studies bridgewater state university english journal of english association indian literature sahitya academy literature and history contemporary asia rupkatha journal on interdisciplinary studies in humanities such asian diaspora uh, and various other journals of repute she works in the area of indian writing in english and plays literature plays and literature gender gender and sexuality studies uh ba professor barbara shamed habercamp is the professor of english at the university of bonn germany her areas of specialization include 18th century british literature and culture and post colonial studies she served on the board of the german society for 18th century uh, studies and organized the society's annual conference in 2008 on the topic of europe and turkey in the 18th century a selection of the conference paper was published with the born up in 2011 she has also organized the annual annual gaps conference in 2017 she is the adjunct professor in the school of liberal arts and human sciences oro university Uh, professor rebecca duncan is the post doctoral research fellow at the department of languages and the member of linnaeus university center for the conferences in the colonial and post colonial studies she, she researches in post colonial literature with a focus on southern africa and a particular interest in the world ecological ap approaches the body and the embodied men speculative forms and the decolonial thinking Her current project is generously funded by the Careford Foundation and entitled Materializing Violence Speculative Factions and New Cultures of Resistance from Sub-Saharan Africa. Rebecca has published widely on speculative genres in global contexts. She is the author of Southern Africa Gothic, University of Wales, University of Chicago 2018. She was shortlisted for the 2019 Alan Lloyd Smith Memorial Prize. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Sripathi, to chair the session. Please, let's begin. Uh, yeah, hello everybody. I'm Priyanka. As uh, 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 another Priyanka introduced me, so the session is going to last for about forty-five minutes, and we can take questions in the last. We have two speakers in this panel: uh, Professor Barbara Smith from University of Bonn, Germany, and uh, Dr. Rebecca Duncan from Linnaeus University, Sweden. So the first, uh, uh, I first invite uh, Professor Barbara Smith to speak, uh, and uh, her topic is borders, mental and physical. Of course, we have heard of borders in the uh, in the course of sociology and political uh, political science. It is an overutilized terms. However, in the times of pandemic, it has become relevant like never before. And I'll be very happy to take uh, take up what Professor Barbara Smith has to say about this. Over to you, Professor. Professor Smith. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much for this introduction. I'm greatly honoured to be part of this important event, and I would like to thank the organisers and also the panelists for their thoughtful contributions. Now, my subject is borders, mental and physical. In Germany last year, we commemorated the wall of the, the sorry, the fall of the Berlin Wall 30 years ago. When the wall came down, people envisioned a world without borders. President Reagan had urged the Soviet leader Gorbachev at the Brandenburg Gate to, quote, tear down this wall, unquote. 30 years on, the situation has changed dramatically. Numerous new border barriers have sprung up across the world. Since 9-11 at the latest, the idea of a world without borders has turned into a utopia. In 2016, a different Republican captured the White House with the slogan, build that wall, to block migration from Central America. Elizabeth Vallet, in her study, Borders, Fences and Walls, State of Insecurity from 2014, has listed the new borders, fences and walls. 
in Bulgaria, Greece and Israel, the new wall between Turkey and Syria, not to mention the growing number of border barriers in other parts of the world, in Asia, on the African continent and so on. The symbolic value of borders and walls seems to have shifted from a deplorable sign of imprisonment and lack of freedom to a desirable sign of protection and fortification against others. Bulgaria is a case in point. In 2015, in the wake of a massive influx of refugees and asylum seekers into Europe, Bulgaria built a wall along the Turkish border and further fortified it the year after. While, after the end of communism in 1989, state authorities in Bulgaria were quick to tear down the borders that had until then imprisoned the population. So, walling in has shifted to walling out. In Europe, anxieties, especially about the changes instigated by the influx of migrants, have resulted in controversy over border control. The humanitarian gesture of German Chancellor Angela Merkel in 2015, encouraging fellow citizens to welcome refugees and asylum seekers and to make a communal effort to accommodate them, spearheaded by the well-known slogan, wir schaffen das, we can do it, has led to division rather than unity. Anxieties, especially about migration and concomitant social and cultural changes, have led to a backlash against globalization and the resurgence of nationalisms in many parts of the world. They've brought the European Union to its breaking point and have played a major part in the Brexit referendum. Until very recently, however, nobody could have envisaged a pandemic which has resulted in a global shutdown and a closing of national borders worldwide, barring travel across national, even across regional borders, barring mobility, a basic human right after all, not only to refugees and asylum seekers, but to all of us. Of course, vulnerability or precariousness are distributed unevenly. While for us, our summer holidays abroad is at stake, I can't even begin to imagine what the situation is like in refugee camps across the world. In the following, I wish to explore the literal and the symbolic value of borders, with some references to their representation in fictional texts. Borders are not only a material reality, but also potent and populist signifiers of national sovereignty and personal security that promise to prevent the influx of refugees and illegal workers, also drugs, weapons and terror. And now also the COVID-19 virus. As walls and fences, borders are characterized by an almost archaic materiality which stands in stark contrast to our liquid modernity, which is marked by a high degree of technology and mobility. In her study, Border Wall Aesthetics, Eliza Ganivet has argued that border walls are blank screens onto which people project their fears. Borders give rise to a logic of difference, the othering that Sashi Tarot talked about in his presentation yesterday and they serve as imaginaries of danger that are translated into figurations of inclusion and exclusion. The dangers, they suggest, are lurking at the periphery. Walling out, however, always means walling in at the same time, so that investigations must concern both. How nations define themselves against the others, those beyond, by exercising control over their borders, and how this control affects notions of the community and the individual. I wish to go briefly into two recent novels that negotiate border epistemologies in contrasting ways. British author John Lanchester's 2019 novel, The Wall, and the novel Exit West 
from 2017 by British Pakistani writer Mohsin Hamid. Both novels are refugee narratives. Lanchester's dystopia describes a world flooded after the climate change in which Britain is surrounded by a huge wall to ward off climate refugees. Hamid's protagonists flee the civil war, most probably in Syria, via the Greek island of Mykonos to London and finally to a place near San Francisco. Lanchester explores the implication of the wall as an attempt for at absolute control in which the literal and the symbolic conflate. The British setting of Lanchester's novel remains eerily unspecific as identity of place and people seem to be swallowed up by the wall as an all engulfing life defining presence, generating isolated, de individualized citizens governed by fear rather than empathy and reduced to the sheer will of survival. The novel describes the society characterized by an atmosphere of social frost in which the children cannot forgive their parents for not having prevented climate change. And it's a society characterized by surveillance. Citizenship amounts to being within the confines of the wall and an implanted biometric ID chip. Those beyond the wall are simply called the others. All that is known about them is that they come in boats and that they are, quote, clever, desperate and ruthless, unquote, and that they must be kept out at all costs. The novel provides no insight into their existence. At the center of the wall, at the center of the novel is the wall, whose imposing material, concrete and life-defining presence Lanchester has attempted to evoke by means of concrete poetry. At the same time, the novel also explores the limits of physical and psychological control. Firstly, by focusing on the extreme hardship the protagonist suffers while serving, like all Britons, his two-year duty as guard on the wall. Secondly, the guards do not manage to control the wall. When the others manage to get over the wall, those on guard have their chips removed and are expelled from the country, set out on a lifeboat, being effectively turned into others themselves. It dawns on the protagonist that being other is a matter of perspective rather than of absolute difference. However, a new we or community is not in sight. The battle of survival continues on the sea. While Lanchester's novel negotiates the social implications of radical control, Hamid's novel, in contrast, describes a porous, permeable world in which the walls have magic doors that allow migration and windows to the world, such as smartphones that connect people globally. Exit West is very much about letting go, letting go of home, of love, life, and it spells out its costs as well as its potential. While Nadia, the female protagonist, embraces the opportunities on offer to her, Saeed, the male protagonist, wallows in nostalgia and seeks the company of people from his own ethnicity. Hamid's novel does not gloss over the difference in accessibility of those magic doors, depending on social class. But it insists that we are all migrants through time and space, and that even the idea of home therefore becomes relative. One of the many interspersed episodes that serve to emphasize time-space compression and synchronicity deals with an old woman at Palo Alto who never left her house, but the world around her changed completely, for instance, became multicultural. The capacity, quote, to imagine a plausible, desirable future, unquote, is at the heart of the novel. And it would be cynical, I think, to call this utopian. In the current global crisis, conspiracy theories 
an atmosphere of distrust and suspicion, competition over material goods like protective masks and COVID-19 vaccine, as well as over the correct protective measures and the quality of political leadership seem to be stronger, paradoxically, than the sense of connectedness and cooperation. We can only speculate that the symbolic currency of border control will have a lasting effect even after borders have been reopened. On the other hand, as many speakers at this conference have pointed out, the current unprecedented global crisis is an opportunity for systemic change to refashion the world to a resilient, sustainable, equal and just place. Tremendous changes are happening. Everything seems to be up to debate just now and the exposed fragilities of globalization, the future of the EU populism, the question of whether it is liberal or author authoritarian states that better manage extreme social distress or whether it is in fact people's trust in government that will be the crucial determinant in performance. To return to Hamid's novel Exit West, we do have the chance and it depends on us to imagine a plausible, desirable future. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor. Uh, I think uh, we will take questions in the last. I also have a couple of questions, but I think it will be good if Professor Duncan, uh, we can invite and uh, she could speak. Uh, so my next guest for this session is uh, Dr. Rebecca Duncan, who is from Linnaeus University, Sweden, and she is going to speak on pandemic, cheap nature and speculative fiction on the prescience of Lingama's severance. Uh, over to you, Professor Duncan. Thanks very much, Priyanka. Uh, so I, I'm uh, unfortunately I'm going to have to actually start with a, um, a small disclaimer, which is I found when I was actually I, when it came down to writing this talk, I found that um, cheap nature was one the theoretical category too many for my 15 minutes um, time frame, and so I'm kind of working within broadly the same paradigm, but I uh, am not going to be talking about cheap nature specifically. I have retitled my paper, uh, Pandemic, Social Reproduction and Speculative Fiction on the Prescience of Ling Ma's Severance. But if anybody does want to talk to me about cheap nature in the q and I'm very happy to do that. So I'm going to uh, talk about the relationship between speculative fiction and um, the currently unfolding COVID-19 pandemic. But I'd like to begin with a quote from uh, Karl Marx, from whom we have heard um, many times already in the course of this weekend. Uh, the quote runs as follows, it's taken from the German ideology. The first premise of all human existence and therefore of all history is that humans must be in a position to live in order to be able to make history. But life involves before everything else, eating and drinking, a habitation, clothing, and many other things. Today, as thousands of years ago, these needs must daily and hourly be fulfilled merely in order to sustain human life. So I'd like you to hold those ideas in your mind as I move on now to discuss uh, a novel by Ling Ma, which was published in uh, 2018. I've, I've not got a PowerPoint, but I'm, I'm here is the novel so that you can see it. Uh, it's a, a take on the zombie pandemic novel and it's titled Severance. There's a long tradition in speculative, speculative literature and film of using the figure of the zombie to critique systems of capital, with perhaps the most widely known examples coming from George R. Romero in the last decades of the 20th century. Romero's films see the figure of the zombie transform from an avatar for the enslaved, an image that originates in West African cosmologies, to a ravenous undead monster animated only by its wild and contagious hunger for human flesh. Romero's Dawn of the Dead in particular, featuring famous scenes of shopping malls filled with shambling corpses, uses this version of the zombie as an indictment of erupting US consumer culture amid early neoliberal transformations in the 1970s. Severance joins with, but adapts, this tradition of critical speculative fiction. In fact, Ma's elegantly understated horror narrative draws directly on Romero, as I will mention in a moment. Published in 2018, the novel currently makes for uncanny reading, not least in its astute descriptions of what now seem to be pandemic banalities. 
surgical face masks become fashion accessories, for example. Working in an office becomes a hugely dangerous activity. Restaurants close suddenly around their patrons. There are more concrete parallels too. The central thrust of the narrative tracks the emergence of Shen fever in the factories of China's Shenzhen province. And this apocalyptic illness spreads across the world until in Ma's scenario, human society everywhere collapses. Speculative fiction is good at imagining the future, but horror fiction specifically is frequently strangely prophetic. Stephen Shapiro has argued that this is because horror fictions tend to emerge at those cyclically recurring moments of crisis that shape the history of capitalism. Horror registers the experience of anxiety these produce and does so importantly often with recourse to the tropes that surfaced amid the previous crisis. Ma's nods to Ramiro thus appear especially important. Dawn of the Dead can be read as a cipher for the anxiety that, that emerged precisely with the crisis of profitability in the 1970s after the post-war boom period. This, of course, is neoliberalism's inaugural moment. The neoliberal agenda is associated with an ideology of aggressive individual responsibility, with privatization and the retraction of the welfare state. That is the shearing away of those institutions which guarantee that life can continue to sustain and reproduce itself in the way that we've seen Marx suggest is the precondition for the social. But it is also synonymous, this is neoliberalism, most importantly for Romero's text anyway, with the shift in the US economy from industry to finance capital and credit, and with the outsourcing of material production to cheaper locales ac across the global south. Romero's ravenous undead in their American shopping mall, <clears throat> excuse me, in their American shopping mall, darkly reflect the rampant consumerism this transition to credit unleashed. Ma's novel directly refers to Ramiro, as I've said, most, of, most obviously it is substantially set in a shopping mall, but it importantly also adapts his vision of the undead. Severance's zombies are not a cannibalistic horde. They do not hunger for human flesh or indeed for anything else. And so they do not operate as metaphors for unbridled consumerism. Instead, the fevered, which is the term that Ma uses for the afflicted, are gradually emptied of consciousness. The fungal infection that causes this form of zombieism reduces human activity to a series of routine actions performed on a loop. Taxi drivers continue to drive, for example. Housewives set and reset dinner tables ad infinitum until the bodies undertaking these tasks wither away. It is important in this sense that the scope of fevered activity does not extend to those activities that are necessary for human sustenance, to eating, sleeping, seeking shelter, and so on. I suggest that this adaptation, which shifts the locus of anxiety from early neoliberal consumerism to the material work of production and reproduction, is a response to capital in its specifically late neoliberal form. It is this shift too, I think, that is responsible for Severance's uncanny propheticism in the present pandemic. In other words, and this is my central thesis, Ma's novel skewers precisely those dimensions of reality under late neoliberal capital that the actually unfolding pandemic is also bringing to light. In the first instance, Ma uses the trope of zombie pandemic that spreads out from industrial China to make visible the geopolitical relation of production that late or post-crisis neoliberalism has obscured in the financialized territories of the world economy. Early neoliberalism, as we've seen in relation to Ramiro's film, outsources material industry to optimally deregulated regions, predominantly in the global south. The resulting immateriality of deindustrialized, financialized economies has further been augmented after the crash of 2008, as Nick Cernacek has shown by the rise of the digital economy, what he calls platform capitalism, which recenters the neoliberal agenda around data frontiers and operates via the network effects of Web 2.0. The vertiginous virtuality of the New York world inhabited by Mars' millennial protagonist, who blogs, texts, Googles, etc., is fractured as the pandemic brings this zone back into contact with the far-flung but nonetheless crucial industrial base on which it depends. The uneven relationship between these spaces is made explicit in the text further when Candace, who is the central character, visits the radically impoverished factory workers in Shenzhen province before the plague takes hold. Ma's narrative thus exposes, to borrow a Trotskyist formulation recently taken up by the Warwick Research Collective, the still combined and uneven nature of the late neoliberal world system. And this has also been reasserted by the effects of COVID-19. 
the global spread of the virus has reconfirmed what is now a platitude of globalization discourse, that regions of the planet are interconnected and interdependent, but it has also exposed the radically unequal structure of this global geography, as it is emerging that the brunt of COVID-19's human and economic casualties will be borne by the world's poorest regions. And as it reminds us that the neoliberal program works on a global scale through the development of underdevelopment, that is the depression of production costs through the outsourced manufacture of what Jason Moore calls cheap lives, Ma's novel also perhaps still more vehemently critiques the related strategy of offloading the costs of maintaining human life, of bare survival, onto individual subjects. This process begins with the retraction of the social safety net in the 1970s, but it has been radically intensified after the crisis of 2008. The age of platform capitalism, as Cernicek shows, operates via a doctrine of extreme leanness, which on top of existing state welfare cuts, reduces the number of employees in a given firm to the absolute minimum, prioritizing freelancers and the self-employed to whom no legal employee benefits accrue. We are talking here about the rise of the gig economy in the face of already emaciated state support, of systemic job insecurity and precarious work. The result is a, glo a global, albeit unevenly afflicted demographic whose capacity to survive, to reproduce themselves day to day, constantly teeters on the brink. Ma's novel is filled explicitly with characters in these positions and her zombie apocalypse scenario follows the consequences of their prevalence through to its systemic logical conclusion. In the narrative, human society collapses precisely because Shen fever is a disease that, bluntly put, stops people from taking care of themselves. It directly hinders what Titi Bhattacharya calls the life-making activity of self-reproduction. It turns out, to invoke Marx's figurative formulation, that labor which is literally dead cannot keep the global capitalist economy afloat. In this way, Ma's narrative underscores the necessity of reproductive work for capital's continued operation. At the same time, it points to the late neoliberal transformations that retract what meager supports remained for these life-making activities at the end of the 20th century. Again, there are clear parallels with the pandemic present. COVID-19 has shifted the business of self-sustenance out of the background of the everyday. This is chiefly because the virus has exposed how responsibility for reproduction has been progressively offloaded across the intensifying neoliberal age from states and employers to individuals. Discouraged from working with no access to state support, freelancers in the UK, for example, faced risks ranging from eviction to starvation in the early phases of the pandemic. Similar problems confront the US where they're augmented by privatized healthcare, which according to some reports has deterred the uninsured from seeking treatment when afflicted. These issues recur across the global south where they're further compounded as they are among the poorest northern communities by the deleterious conditions in which many people live their daily lives. How can you implement social distancing and meticulous hygiene as several southern commentators have asked where access to habitation and basic sanitation is severely restricted as it is for example in the slums of Johannesburg, Lagos or Mumbai. To conclude then, if Ma's severance seems uncannily prophetic when read in the context of the coronavirus situation, this is because the novel's vision of pandemic is a narrative device for underscoring and interrogating violent dimensions of late neoliberalization, which COVID-19 is actually bringing to the fore. As they make visible how capital in its current formation relies on the production of states of precarity on a global scale, that is the degree to which it works fundamentally by placing basic life-making activities in peril, these viruses, real and imagined, illuminate and augment a crisis that is already underway. And finally, so if Ma's novel imagines something like a corona capitalist crisis from the perspective of COVID-19's past, then it also, if hesitantly, can be understood as moving towards a less violent future or perhaps gesturing in that direction. The narrative hinges on a scenario in which consciousness is drained from sentient bodies, but it itself potentially has the opposite effect. Here I'm referring to what the feminist movements of the mid 20th century termed consciousness raising, a bringing to consciousness of the systems that produce unlivable lives. As it maps the structures within which life-making becomes impossible, severance performs this function. It names the problem 
to borrow a different activist phraseology. And in so doing, it implicitly invokes at least the possibility of a solution. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Duncan. Uh, uh, that was wonderful. So we have had uh, two sessions, wonderful sessions, quite uh, relevant to the theme of the conference, imagining, imagining the post-coronavirus world. Uh, and uh, though the, the onset of the disease was very sudden, yet the imagining could be very thoughtful. And what better way uh, than literature the, uh, I mean, that could, you know, uh, discuss such ideas. I think uh, I, I have one question uh, from uh, Professor Barbara and another one from Professor Duncan, and then we can maybe open it for others by the time they can. Yeah, I, I already have some questions, uh, but maybe I can take up mine before. Uh, my question is to Professor Barbara. When you talk about these uh, borders, uh, mental and physical, do you think, while you know uh, the whole multinationals were coming, new liberalism was going on. Uh, there was everybody was talking about the whole world shrinking, and all of a sudden, this whole pandemic. Do you think it has limited or expanded the borders, uh, mentally and physically? I mean, any which way you would like to interpret this question, I would be happy to hear your thoughts on that. I think, um, um, as I said, um, for the past two, maybe three decades, um, borders, new borders have amassed all over the, the world. So this notion of a world without borders um, has gone bust anyway. And now we've got this coronavirus. The whole thing is paradoxically, of course, we are all affected. It's a global pandemic. Uh, and um, um, so in theory, um, it shows us that uh, borders are ineffective. On the other hand, as protective measures uh, for all sorts of things, uh, borders are being drawn up and they're being closed just now. So it's a very paradoxical uh, affair. And um, my point is really that um, of course, the national regional borders, as time goes by, will be opened again. Uh, on the other hand, mental borders, I think, are uh, much longer lasting. And we are surrounded with prejudices about, um, you name it, uh, new prejudices that came up with the coronavirus about um, Asians, clearly, and um, um, about Italians, uh, you name it. I won't go into details, uh, um, but uh, these have sprung up during the corona crisis just now, and I think it would take a long time to disrupt these ideas again. Thank you. Thank you so much. I have one question from Professor Johan for Dr. Rebecca, and I think uh, he wants to know, he says, uh, can you say something about the notion of cheap nature and how this is relevant for understanding the various crises? Don't seem to be able to post to, go. okay. So I think uh, uh, very much your disclaimer said that you're not going to talk about the cheap culture uh, in your, uh, cheap nature in your talk, but yes, I think Mr. Johan is interested and if you can uh, comment on that, uh, we'll be happy. Sure, thanks Johan. That's, um, it's good that I get an opportunity to actually to, to, to talk about the thing which I initially really wanted to talk about. So uh, when, I'm talking, when I'm using the term cheap nature, I'm borrowing it from, from Jason Moore, who, um, who thinks of cheap nature as a way of uh, theorizing um, that share, uh, theorizing, theorizing the way that capital never pays its, its debts in full. So what, uh, what labor or what work and energy is drawn into the cash nexus or is drawn into the systems of capital, um, but remains uh, unaccounted for, remains off the books? What, what work or energy is unpaid? And I think if we start to think about cheap nature like that, you can kind of see how um, the concept relates to what I've been talking about. So the work of social reproduction, the work of reproducing and sustaining life has been, um, offshored and offloaded uh, over the history of capitalism, but kind of really intensely in, in, the, in the, the neoliberal period. And uh, there is an element in, in this novel in particular, 
in, in Severance, uh, which frames pandemic as, as, a, as an explicitly ecological phenomenon. So, so the, the, the illness emerges um, at the same time as kind of radical climate events. And there is a suggestion that, that, the, um, that the spread of the pandemic and the sort of sudden and unpredictable appearance of, of, of uh, storms, for example, that kind of decimate the New York landscape, that they are somehow connected. The connection is never really made explicit. Um, and so the the novel is kind of working with a with an ecologic with a with a uh, uh, a sense that uh, pandemic is a kind of an ecological uh, kickback to a a strategy a capitalist strategy which is being mapped across the text which is which is I think a cheap nature strategy um, a, a stra the strategy through which um, capitalism identifies uh, territories that can be appropriated as unpaid territories of energy and work that can be appropriated without compensation. And, and that strategy is a strategy which produces kickbacks like climate change and, and according to some kind of early um, analyses of the origins of COVID-19, although obviously this is all now in question, people we are looking into uh, factories in in Wuhan, I mean, into into um, virology labs in Wuhan and so on. But um, but early, but early on in 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 the pandemic, people were, were kind of linking a wet market to um, uh, the clearing of 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 uh, forests and the kind of um, displacement of peasant farmers and how these kinds of these kinds of precisely kind of cheap nature strategies produce kickbacks. Uh, which are unpredictable and kind of hamper accumulation. So I hope that that was sort of rele relevant, relatively coherent, but that was kind of the broader thrust of, that's the broader thrust of where I'm moving with this argument. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I don't see any other question, but just I have one more question from Professor Duncan. Uh, you talked about this apocalyptic story where this pandemic, uh, you know, epidemic wipes out. And then I just want I was just curious to know if, you know, it also discusses about, like, for example, we are experiencing now, and if I talk about internet and social media, that has really kept us saner in many ways. Uh, so do you think there is any uh, particular narrative which talks about the relevance of internet or social media in, uh, in the situation of an ep epidemic or, or pandemic like this? Absolutely, that's a really good question. And actually, I'm thinking very specifically in my wider research at the moment about um, about uh, narr social media narratives. Um, this novel is is uh, this novel is not is it? Yeah, it is. It does. It does engage with social media. Um, I think that and it, and it engages with social media in in a kind of an interestingly dualistic way. Um, so there is this sense of um, an enabling of real connection. Right, which we get through the internet, but what the narrative exposes is is that um, that real connection, that that kind of sense of uh, comfort or human interaction, which is kind of making everything slightly more bearable currently, uh, that's entirely inseparable from the um, the the from the neoliberal system that that according to this narrative has produced the pandemic. So um, so. So, uh, what, what, I mean, when Nick Sonacek is talking about platform capitalism, right, it, it, we're reminded that things like social media are, are uh, um, kind of, they're the sort of front for uh, an enormous appropriative agenda. So, so, so social media is, social media is social media on the surface, but it is, um, it's a data harvesting machine uh, in, in reality, right? And um, this kind of matrix sense of the world, <laughs> and uh, and so and so yes, I think it's a very good question. It's a very good question, and probably one which will lead you to say all sorts of interesting things about the kind of possibility of resistance, sort of from within or something like that. Um, but uh, this narrative, uh, specifically, would uh, suggest that we are suspicious of the kind of connectivity that that social media enables, precisely because of its connection to wider systems that produce precarity, oppression, and potentially uh, apocalypse. Uh, 
any other question that we want to take up? I, I don't see any uh, in question and answer session. If there is anything else, I think you can, uh, any, I, all the participants, anyone who's interested in more in Professor Barbara's and Dr. Rebecca Duncan's uh, research, I think they can get in touch. Uh, with this, I think we come to the end of the session. I thank both my uh, uh, speakers of the session, Professor Barbara and Dr. Rebecca, for giving this wonderful talk. And I thank Dr. Devedi for giving me this opportunity to chair this session. It was wonderful. Uh, since yesterday, I have been hearing so many talks. I think uh, the conference is going great. Uh, I wish good luck to Oro University for holding many more conferences like this.